Greetings, gardeners and non-gardeners alike. <laughs> oh, well, those of you who are familiar with this channel, you know that every once in a while I will depart from talking about plants, gardens, vegetables, and guitars and wander into social issues, uh, things of import that I see in our society and so on. I tend to try to stay away from politics and religion because I don't really want to get anybody really angry because if I get them too mad, they probably aren't going to listen to anything I got to say anyhow. But yeah, today is one of those days. Um, situation I see out there in the world today, I just, I, I've got to, I've got to address it. And uh, the strongest force in the human universe, in our reality, as far as I'm concerned, is belief. It doesn't matter what you believe in, whether you believe in peace, you believe in love, you believe in God, you believe in politics, whatever you believe in, you know. We all have belief systems. The belief systems are not necessarily indicative of what's actually going on, they have to do so much with what's going on in here and what's going on in our society at large too because we get all this feedback from everybody around us. Human beings are not disconnected islands. Um, I mean I live on an island and yeah I'm a little bit like a rock or at least I like playing rock and roll but I'm not isolated either. Everything that goes on from everybody around me affects what happens with me too and it affects my thought process therefore it affects my belief system. And I grew up in a world where myself and most everybody else around me believed that wealth was good. It's the American way, right? Yeah, everybody wants to be rich. Um, you know, at least we want to have plenty, probably more than we really need for most of us. Well, I'm going to step on a few people's toes because I'm going to come forward and I'm going to say that wealth is actually, for us, a form of socially acceptable mental illness. Sounds strange, doesn't it? It's pretty simple, though. Um, to quote Thich Nhat Hanh, the uh, Zen Buddhist monk from Vietnam who had audience with John F. Kennedy and Charles de Gaulle during the Vietnam War. He was an advocate of what's known as engaged Buddhism, and rather than sitting in the monasteries, you know, that he would go out into the streets and he would try to attempt to make things better. Well, one of his philosophies was, all things interbeing are. Now, it's a very strange sentence, but I have had, uh, you know, an audience with Thich Nhat Hanh in the past and listened to him speak. And I gotta admit, he's got a point here. You really can't take something from one place, move it to another, so you have more of whatever it is and still have the same amount where you took it from. Okay, so from his point of view, the uh, Debutantes in Hyannisport, Massachusetts, with their rich, wealthy, beautiful lifestyles, you know, and fathers who have been presidents and congressmen and so on, that their affluent life basically is the reason why there were prostitutes in the streets of Saigon. Basically because America made itself rich on this war, yet in Vietnam, they were stripped of their wealth in the process. So basically, anytime you take something from one place and you move it to another, somebody has less than they needed and you probably have more than you actually needed. This is a simple concept. It's really, really pretty easy to understand. You know, there was a, a time, it was a day and age when there were very few people on this earth, um, and this didn't matter. So more than enough to go around for everybody on the whole planet. But these days, we, from my point of view, and I'm probably not the only one, I believe that we've exceeded what really is the human population limit on this planet. Uh, I don't see that we actually have environmental problems or that we need to save the Earth. Okay. 
what we have is a human population problem, and when we talk about saving the earth, what we're really talking about is human beings attempting to save their own keister from extinction, because uh, it's us that would go away in the process, most likely, and not the earth. So, and uh, with this in mind, I would like to address the fact that wealth, which Americans venerate, Everywhere I go, everybody wants to be rich, everybody wants to have, you know, multiple cars and so on and so forth. But, like I said, a long time ago, maybe this was possible, but today, too many people on earth for that. There just is not enough of everything to go around for everybody that exists here. Um, I don't think there is anyway, at least... People don't think that there is, and belief is very powerful. And so the result will be struggling, tariffs, wars, sanctions, border walls, uh, you know, and, and on and on. Uh, when there's two-thirds more people on Earth than there was when I was born, and I feel the pressure. Okay, the pressure on the system is getting ready to bust because of all the people we have here. Perhaps we wouldn't have to worry about wealth as a problem if we could control population. But boy, if I want to start a feud, all I got to do is talk, start talking about limiting human birth and uh, then again the belief systems and religion and so on that extend beyond that. The people believe these things so deeply in their hearts and minds and collectively as a human consciousness that approaching the source problems, the reasons other than the fact that we can't stop breeding, um, that we have too many people here is not easy. Uh, Jacques Cousteau in the Rio uh, Summit on Environment many years back, he was almost thrown out on his rear end because he suggested that the environmental problem was a human population problem. Well, he was right, but nobody wanted to hear it. You know, Not even in the summit they didn't want to hear it. That's just not the kind of message. Because it means we've got to change the way we look at everything. It's not quite so hard to address the idea that egalitarianism and equality for people is a better idea than hoarding and wealth. That's a little easier to comprehend than when you take stuff. Somebody else hasn't got it. And, but because wealth and the veneration of the accumulation of wealth and richness is so much a deep part of the American psyche and the Western psyche, period. Maybe even the Eastern psyche, I mean, but in the United States for sure, being rich is something that we all, ooh, ooh, rich man, rich man, rich woman, you know, wow, you know. We, we do this, we do this, and it's, it's actually, it's a social disease. Um, because it's ingrained and we believe in it, but it's not real. It's a belief system. That's all it is. It starts with the beginning of agriculture. <laughs> and so you all can blame me for this problem because recently having had a, a, a National Geographic genome done on my DNA, turns out that Bill just happens to be uh, a member of a group of human beings that were the first farmers on the face of this earth. My ancestors invented farming. Duh, uh, I mean, does it show? It, talk about things running in the blood. I didn't know this. I've been farming my entire life. Um, gardening, nursery, agriculture. It's just, it, it seems to just run in the blood. And uh, apparently it's true. Well, you know, the, the luck for the rest of you is that that line of human beings is almost completely extinct, and my DNA is less than 1% of the rest of the human race, okay? That, in other words, I am an oddball because I still carry that group. They didn't breed out very well, and so they kind of died off. But agriculture is where it all started, because when we are hunters and gatherers, Basically, the young hunters would be the ones who'd bring in the most meat, you know, and the young women probably brought in the most roots and fruits and seeds and whatever that we were gathering back to the tribes. And the tribes then naturally shared all of this, okay, 
We didn't have one guy that says, no, I, I shot that buffalo, I stabbed that buffalo, that's my buffalo, I'm going to eat it all, you know. That didn't happen. Everybody got a piece, you know. That's the way it worked. And so, because our hunter-gatherer societies were um, equal, everybody had equality in most of these societies. We didn't stimulate the old fish brain uh, to be able to go into a fear attack that the sharks are coming. Because that's kind of what happens when you start to spread wealth upward and people don't get what they actually need. There's a part of our brain that when things are unequal will naturally react by creating stress hormones in the brain. And these stress hormones generate patterns, wiring, and fear in our brains that we need to hoard. That hoarding is what we need to do. And that started with agriculture because the farmer, well, he grew a crop. Well, he had more barley than the next guy did because he was a farmer. Then in turn, somebody else maybe had something to offer that farmer that that farmer really wanted. And so he would move most of the barley off to what we now call a middleman, okay? And that guy would then hoard the grain, uh, you know, sometimes I guess in, uh, oh, in ancient Egypt they did start some of the grain storage programs, and in that case I guess stuff was kind of moved back more uh, evenly through the society because they had to keep all the workers happy or you couldn't build the pyramid, and most of the grain turned into beer anyway, so who cared? But that's kind of where it all started was where things were no longer distributed equally and some people had more stuff than other people had. Today there's still um, a uh, oh, Bushman-like hunter-gatherer uh, society in Africa um, that lives in the traditional means of hunting, gathering. They really haven't moved on from that period. And um, these people don't experience depression. They're the only society on earth that has no depression. And, it's because the old fish brain in the core over there that was originally evolved for fishes to go, wow, it's a shark, quick, go to the reef, you know. This isn't getting stimulated with stress because everything is shared between people. Everybody's got what they need. What's the problem? There's no competition for it. It doesn't set that thing off. Most of the depression we experience in uh, Western society, which is rampant today, God, I don't know how many prescriptions for Prozac and... <laughs> It's ridiculous. There's so much of it. It's going in the toilets. It's getting into the water, and they're afraid none of the fish are going to be depressed anymore, and they won't go away from the sharks. You know, it's it's really at a uh, epidemic proportion. This depression. There's a lot of reasons behind it, but one of the major reasons is the lack of equality in our societies. Nothing's equal in a capitalistic society. You get what you got because you pulled yourself up by your bootstraps and you took it from somebody else. You know. Um, it is the reason today that I would say a current man sitting in the White House, for instance, should not be there. My point of view, the guy is mentally ill because his entire purpose in being is the accumulation of wealth. He is the epitome. He's an archetype in our society of the rich guy, you know. And just about everything about his thinking is off-center. It certainly will not take us into the future because the idea of trying to lock down the borders and to try to put tariffs on other people and that America's not getting an equal share and, and, and all of this. We've got to have more nukes, got to upgrade the nuclear arsenal, you know. This all comes from the fact that things aren't equal, people. It comes out of wealth and his brain, never having been anywhere else but wealthy, is pretty much permanently fixed into that and there's no way you can repair it. Now unfortunately he got in the White House. <sighs> and that's a real problem for us. And that's not exactly what I'm here to address either. Somebody else can worry about that, the system or whatever. But fact of the matter is, is that we venerate wealth and because we venerate wealth we create our own problems and we actually have a social mental illness that's based on the idea that wealth is good because we have such a strong belief system in it. Okay. Now, 
you know, you've got Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and so everybody needs to have basic security in life in order to be able to achieve self-realization and have self-esteem. If you're suffering because you haven't got food, because you haven't got a place to sleep, because your clothes aren't right, on and on and on, there's no way that you can ever fully be what you might have been as a human being. Because you're going to get trapped at a certain level in life where you're struggling for proper survival. And it doesn't even necessarily mean that you have a real struggle. A lot of our struggles are again in belief. In a society where we believe in wealth, if you don't have it, well, you think you're short. So you're struggling, okay? Chances are you may actually have enough to be comfortable, but... You're not going to be because you're constantly assaulted by the flashy, sparkly Madison Avenue ads that say you got to have a new Chevrolet, you got to have an Apple smartphone, you got to have this, you got to have that, you know, you got to be prettier, you got to have blonde hair, you got to have whatever it is. It's always something that we're reaching for. It has a lot to do with the fact that human beings themselves are completely empty. Uh, I don't exist. Uh, Bill's a collection of ideas that I picked up along the road of life. I am not actually that is Bill, the personality, is not actually the real human. The actual human lays back beyond this. Uh, it's another story for another day, but we do kind of naturally have a void and a vacuum within all of us because at some level, subconsciously, I think we actually realize that we aren't here. <laughs> or I know I'm not here anyway. Uh, first steps in towards in, in, enlightenment, I guess, in, in Buddhism is to understand the, the fact that you're empty. <laughs> You're not there. But, unfortunately, a lot of us don't understand that. The feeling of emptiness gnaws at us, and so we keep trying to fill it. And, of course, the idea that we can fill it with wealth, well, that's cultural. You know, we're, we're, it's, it's thrown at us, literally. We're, we're spoon-fed, shovel-fed this <laughs> manure from birth. Um, no, I was. I was. And I, I don't think I ever questioned it. Until one day, as a teen, I was in a music store, and I was in the corner with a Marshall amp behind me, and a, and a Les Paul, and I was playing the blues, and playing the blues, and all of a sudden this guy come walking in with a guitar case, he's staring at me, puts the case down, and when I finished picking, he went, You're the best darn blues guitar player I ever heard! Hi, my name is... We'll leave it out, okay? Well, he and I became lifelong friends. We are still friends. Now, it turns out that he was an acoustic guitarist and a finger picker, whereas I was more of, you know, rock and roll, blues style type guy. Anyway, it was a, it was a match made in heaven and or maybe in hell because <laughs> his folks, all the neighbors, all the people we were associated with, they just happened to be extremely wealthy. I grew up in a blue-collar, middle-class background, and later, after my mother underwent a divorce in the 50s, we plunged into poverty. And so I have been in the bottom strata of society at times. Um, I, personally, me, I never really felt the loss, okay? I never was hurt by it. I had a great family. Everything worked out. We were generous despite the fact we didn't have much, and we grew up, all of us in the family, still being quite generous. Um, and I can't take it with me. You know, eventually, times went on, and uh, so we pulled ourselves back up out of poverty. And, you know, today I have a lifestyle that I worked hard for, but and I was lucky, and it came to me too by serendipity, but things are a lot better today. I have everything that I need and maybe more. Uh, in fact, I have plenty enough that my self-esteem and I feel that it is satisfied and that I feel I actually have a purpose in life. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I wish to leave the world a better place than I found it. This is one of my goals. That's that's a self-actualization type thing there. So you have to be above, oh, I'm hungry and my clothes are terrible and I don't have a place to sleep before you can even think about things like this. But anyhow, so my buddy's parents were rich and I never met rich people before. 
and once I started meeting them, I won't go into details, but I had to admit, they were the craziest people I have ever met in my life. They didn't have their heads screwed on at all. I mean, guy, they, the guy's dad slept with loaded guns in the nightstand. There were loaded guns all over the house. He was afraid of everything, okay? The neighbors were even worse. I know the 50-year-old neighbor next door got busted for growing pot and then ran off with the other neighbor's 18-year-old daughter to California. I mean, holy smoke, what a bunch of nut jobs. So, as a young man, right around 18, I kind of decided that wealth ain't where it's at. It warps you. It'll pervert your life. And that there must be a better way to live. So I spent most of my life kind of looking at that because of it. I did come to a epiphany later on in life that I did need to focus on the generation of wealth to some extent to make my life comfortable so I didn't have to struggle and suffer. So I was able to actually accomplish what I wanted to do in my heart. And so I kind of upped the ante and I have talked about investing and so on. But I am not advocating the fact that Americans should continue to try to grab everything they can off the face of the planet and lock it down for ourselves. Ain't gonna cut it, people! We'll be all dead from a nuclear war by the end of the 21st century if every one of us thinks that we're supposed to have more than everybody else on the planet has. It ain't gonna work. <laughs> There's gonna be wars over oil, which there already are. Wars over water, which we haven't quite gotten to yet, but they're in this century, I'm quite certain. Especially if we don't take care of the water we have. Currently, we got a bozo in the EPA that is trying to liquidate most of the environmental regulations. I'm telling you, you got to protect what you're living on because this is the only thing there is. That little blue rock out there. That's it, folks. I mean, you can look at Mars, and I'm all in favor of space travel, but good luck. I mean, hell, I'd rather live in New Mexico than Mars. They look about the same from my point of view, but no hard feelings, folks, in New Mexico. <laughs> you're just both red. <laughs> anyway, Wealth is a disease. Uh, wealth is spawned by a sense of fear that we don't have enough. And it's when it becomes compulsive to the point that we begin to accumulate more and more and more and more well beyond what we or anybody we knew could ever possibly use. Somebody else out there doesn't have enough. It's really simple. And if somebody else out there hasn't got it all, I mean, I don't care whether or not you have the, the moral sense or the bleeding heart, you know, and you're a leftist liberal that, oh, we got to take care of all the poor people and all that, you know. The only reason we got any poor people is we got rich people. That's the problem, you know. And so this is just, this has nothing to do with my heartstrings. Really, it has to do with protecting my keister. I'd like to be around at least long enough to be able to die peacefully over here in my sleep and get planted under an orange tree as a pile of ashes. I don't want to turn up uh, as dust from an atomic wind, you know? So, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get some negative feedback on all this because being anti-wealth is really being anti-capitalism and is very much uh, allied with being anti-American on top of it. You know, um, you got whole religious sects on this planet that believe that it was God's divine right that you be a rich person. Well, that's a little nuts because again, wealth is an overaccumulation and it's a lack of equal distribution of materials. We get down to the point with the population we have on this earth today and there isn't going to be enough water. There's not going to be enough fish to go around. There may not even be enough clean air. Ask a traffic cop in Tokyo today what he thinks about that one. You know, a lot of implications otherwise as far as environmental destruction, pollution, and the destruction of systems on earth that support us and all other life in the process again of attempting to collect wealth. Uh, part of this whole thing is, you know, we invented planned obsolescence, okay? And planned obsolescence is, again, another issue as far as, oh, 
Oh, we have so much. The weekend is for to, hey, throw this out. Gee, that's out of style. Oh, my God. Look, my pocket lighter's empty again, you know. Oh, wow, this wore out, that wore out. Things built to actually decompose quickly so you can sell more and more and more and more of them. This whole system's flawed. It's not well. It needs adjustment. And the only reason I'm here talking about this is that I don't think too many of us think on this subject. This is not a common social trend. The idea that wealth is mental illness. Okay, wealth is venerated. I'm throwing it out there because I have a platform where I can do that. I kind of feel that gardeners are rational human beings. And gardeners are also used to sharing because good gardeners, they usually got more zucchini than they know what to do with and they dump it off on doorsteps. I mean, I've been known here in Pune as the banana fairy <laughs> because I abandoned whole 60 pound stalks of bananas sometimes on people's doorsteps. Yeah, it happens, you know. And so I think gardeners are people who are really very much in touch with what goes on on the earth. I think we understand uh, systems better than folks who live in high rises in New York City and so on. Uh, I really do. I think being in touch with the earth really helps to see the reality of the planet. And that's all there is, folks. I don't care what's in the belief system. The planet's got a reality. I don't care what you believe. There's a reality. Check against it. You take these beliefs out. Put them down on the table. You know, look at them in front of you and say, okay, now we take this to its extreme extent and look at how does this integrate with everything else that's actually going on here. You know, rainfall, soil, food production, and so on. Does it make sense? Can you continue it? Is it sustainable? Wealth is not sustainable. Wealth is a ripoff. In most cases, wealth creates wars. You know, you kill people to have more. You want their country, you want their gold, you want their oil, we will want their water. The United States has got a lot of good water, folks. Antarctica, I guess we could melt it down, right? Let's have a war over the ice on Antarctica. I don't know, you know, this is, this is what it leads to. And, you know, the same goes with so many of the other beliefs. You put them out there and you look at it and you go, okay, you know, we believe, be fruitful, multiply, and cover the earth with screaming children with dirty diapers, you know. No, uh, that's outmoded. There was a day, back in the day, Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve, being fruitful and multiplying made sense. Today, it's suicide. It's a death sentence for us and for a lot of other species, too, because we're going to take most of them with us when we go. We're going to leave behind sand dunes, rats, and roaches if we're not careful about it. Now, I am not a doomsayer. I'm not a survivalist. I don't believe that the end times are coming anytime soon. I think the planet is pretty tough. And uh, it'll put up with things here for a while. Unfortunately, it's like everything else we do as human beings. We come up with an idea or a product, we throw it out there in the, in the society, in the marketplace, you know, and then later on we turn around and look at it, scratch our heads and go, gee, maybe Nazism wasn't a good form of government, you know, or uh, maybe DDT was messing with the eagle eggs, you know, there's a whole lot of issues and things that we throw this stuff out there. Currently the smartphone, well, going to be all kinds of psychological repercussions for us in our society and social repercussions because of that device. It's drugs, folks. It's tied to the dopamine in the brain, you know, and it's, it's, it's candy. Um, there going to be a lot of problems. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen with the youth as far as the wiring in their brains. I didn't have smartphones, so, you know, I learned to draw, I learned to paint portraits, I learned to play music, I learned to do a whole lot of things, okay? Because I wasn't staring at a screen playing Candy Crush or going, Oh, look, there's a Pokemon in the middle of the intersection, I gotta go get, you know. Uh, yeah, I worry about it, but that's all other story. Yeah, I have uh, folks on the Garden Channel here come come to me frequently and they'll say, hey, why don't you haul in some wood chips, you know, or why don't you get a, a bales of straw and you, you know, and so on and so forth like this. Well, to begin with, folks, um, Hawaii is not exactly like the rest of the mainland in the regards that we don't have a lot of stuff around here to spare. People got their fingers on just about anything that's laying around here. It's an island, okay? 
Um, so we do not have tremendous amounts of usable recyclable materials here that haven't already been called for. But, as they said about wealth, when you take something from point A because you want it, and you remove what looks like an accumulation at point A, and you move it to point B and set it up because you have a use for it, Basically what happens is now you have a positive here, but where you got it from has a negative, and that material really needed to be put back where you found it, because that would then keep systems stable in that location. It's one of the reasons that I am more of a permaculturist, and I do not consider myself to be totally an organic gardener. I started there but I moved on from it because organic has within its philosophy a single flaw if not more than one and it's the idea that moving things from point A to point B to enrich point B in a steady basis is an appropriate way to do business. That has some natural physical problems like shoveling it makes my back hurt you know I have to use trucks with diesel fuel or gasoline to haul that stuff so there's a carbon footprint it's an imbalance you know also my biggest concern is moving in diseases pests here fire ants you know a cokey frog my god and other things that I did not want in my environment and I import it when I bring this stuff in but the main reason why I'm opposed to it is that the philosophy is unsustainable. Um, it is the same as accumulating wealth. It's an imbalance. And when you create an imbalance, eventually something starts going wrong. It's just like that. So I have the same philosophy about economic and social uh, uh, distribution as I do about materials in the garden. It's why I grow alfalfa and till it in. It's why I plant seeds and use them for cover crops, you know, stuff like this. I, I you know, I, it's cool. I've had chickens before and we use the chicken manure in the garden, but, you know, I was buying chicken food or toss, tossing my garbage to the chickens and so on, and so it was a tight cycle. It was a really closed system pretty much. A little bit bringing, being brought in, but not too much. You know, none of this stuff's ever perfect. I'm not saying that you're going to completely change the world with any of it. If you can make a small change, a little contribution. If somebody out there right now listening to me says, you know, he's got a point. There's something wrong with accumulating wealth. There is. You don't need it. I don't need it. I'm a perfectly happy individual. <laughs> yeah, sound happy, don't I? Right. There are some things I'm not happy about, but it isn't my personal state of affairs. It isn't my lifestyle. <laughs> okay. There's stuff out there that ticks me off plenty, but um, I don't have a lot of wealth. I have enough, maybe a little bit more than enough. All of that's earmarked that if I end up walking out of here or falling out of here dead and that it's going to go to Ellen, or it's going to go to my sons, or it's going to go somewhere where somebody can make use of it to help make their lives more comfortable. Um, but my general attitude is, well, I'm here, use it, burn it up, get rid of it. Money ain't good for nothing if you haven't figured out what to turn it into that makes good sense. And if your investing is socially responsible, that money helps leave the planet a better place. If you got more wealth than you know what to do with, you can find places out there that you can make a difference with that money. And it will really help you, too, not just the people that you give it to. All right? There are various different ways. Use your imagination. Be creative. There are lots of great things you can do with wealth because wealth is power. But in general, the power in wealth is not the accumulation of more wealth. The power in wealth is how can you use it to make the world better not just your world, although it will feed back to you. When you do something positive, you can't buy that. <laughs> you can't buy that, man. You make somebody's life a better place, there's no price on that. And that's really, you know, some of the, some of the deepest, best parts of being alive. It's, it's not having a lot of gold. Yeah, gold's beautiful. It really is. You know, it's interesting stuff. There's only so much of that to go around do, though. I mean, hey, you know, all gold that we have here on Earth was made in the core of some poor dying star when it went supernova. Yep.
That's true, folks. All those heavy elements, calcium, iron, nickel, zinc, lead, tin, you know, uh, gold, uh, these were all created in the core of stars that came to the end of their life cycles, formed heavy elements like iron in the core, and then they explode. And when they explode, they vaporize the solar system and all the life around them. Those materials then disperse through the universe as dust. I've always referred to it as the dust theory. You know, that on this side of the universe, there's a shortage of dust. On the other side of the universe, there's an abundance. And so an entire star, solar system goes supernova, destroys itself, and then spreads off through the rest of the universe. Eventually it comes somewhere where it begins coalescing in little spinning balls, and pretty soon you've got a brand new sun, you've got a brand new earth, you've got moons, you've got planets, and you've got people like me, that my bones are made of the core of dying stars. All of the elements in my body are that way. Uh, there is almost an infinite amount of materials that are out there, and they come down at us as particles, dust, micrometeorites, constantly. There is no border wall on the planet. Get a clue. <clears throat> Which means that if there is no border wall on the planet, and 20 miles up there where you all think there might be some kind of a fence or something, no, the universe is breathing inward onto our planet, and the planet is also exhausting outward. Everything is going like this all the time. And, you know, Trumpy and his stupid wall trying to keep all the little brown people south of the border penned in down there in Mexico is a ridiculous idea that has absolutely nothing to do with the nature of the way the universe actually works. And it's a byproduct of how warped your mentality can become when you're extremely wealthy because you can't even understand the systems that are surrounding us. You lose track. It's all based on belief, folks. Okay. So, wealth is not good. I encourage all of you, do not venerate wealth. When you have a wealthy friend, try to help them. They need your help. They really believe that what they're doing is right. Socially, we believe this, and so I am really batting against a wall over here with a sledgehammer. This is worse than knocking down the Berlin Wall when I take on wealth in the United States, because I know you all believe in it so deeply. But if I have managed to kind of get through just a little bit, if you got a wealthy friend, see what you can do to help them. There are ways that their excess consumption can be redistributed into the society. And so I'm not talking socialism necessarily here either, because I know I'm going to get that one. That's going to happen because, you know, that's very much, you know, Marxism in a way as a social platform. But that's back to beliefs. And I don't believe in Marxism. Okay. We live under the system we live on, and we do have free will, a lot of it. Uh, we have quite a bit of freedoms. They're privileges. They're not rights. <laughs> Step over the line one of these days and get thrown in a courtroom. You'll find out how many rights you actually have <laughs> to an attorney, to a phone call, uh, trial by your peers. Uh, those are rights. That's about it. <laughs> the rest of it are privileges, and, but we do have a lot of privileges that allow freedom here. And we can do whatever we want to pretty much with our lives in this country. It's not always true everywhere in the world. A lot of societies are more locked in. People are born as cobblers or whatever they're born as in the family, and they kind of continue the family business and so on, or the government dictates to you what you will be doing. But we don't have that problem here. We can do pretty much whatever we darn well feel like doing here, as long as we don't step over the line and start hurting somebody else with our behavior. So help those wealthy friends. They really do need your help. The fact that they believe they need to accumulate that wealth indicates that there is a deep-seated fear within them that they won't have enough and that somebody else is going to have more than they've got. And so they bring in more and more. If you feel this fear, it's your fish brain. It thinks the sharks are circling. And so wealth is basically heading for the reef. That's what it amounts to. It's an ancient reaction. It goes even below the crocodile brain, okay? This is really a deep thing. And especially in this nation, the far right 
wing are the ones that use this as a tool. Oh, God, they can poke fear, poke fear, poke fear. People are already primed for it, you know. They already have their emptiness that the smartphone fills. Well, they also have fear that's there naturally because of the nature of our society due to lack of equality. Far right wing knows that, people. You're being played, okay, because they, they play with that fear to be able to control you. And so, the less fear you have, the less controllable you are. One of the reasons that I'm an outlandish person who is outspoken and will just kind of like say whatever I feel like saying, it's because I don't have a lot of fear. The worst thing you can do to me is kill me. You know, I've been around long enough that it doesn't really matter anymore. Go ahead, scare me. <laughs> I suppose you come up behind me with a paper bag and go, boom, I'm going to go, oh, for a moment. But it's not going to want to make me accumulate paper bags. <laughs> All right, so there we have it, folks. It's Bill's rant on why being wealthy is a mental illness in our society, and it's about time that we started looking at it as such. Aloha. Happy gardening. And I hope you got more zucchini than you know what to do with this July. Aloha.